Every year, hundreds of liters of rain fall on rooftops and most of it simply disappears unused in the gutter. What if we could turn these raindrops into electricity using technology that was previously considered impossible? A research group from Singapore has achieved something quite remarkable. In their study, they claim to be able to generate a hundred thousand times more electricity this way than anything that has been achieved with previous technologies before. There's a simple trick behind it. What's a trick and what physical effects are behind it is what we are going to talk about today. And with that, welcome to the German Science Guy. My name is Dr. Jakob Botton and in Germany we say Los geht's. Hydropower is one of humanity's oldest success stories. People have been using this powerful, efficient form of green electricity generation for thousands of years. Just as an example, in Germany alone, more than 7,300 hydroelectric power plants feed into the German power grid. They supply around 20 terawatt hours of electricity every year, which means that around 12% of renewable electricity in Germany is generated from water. In total, it accounts for just under 5% of total electricity production in Germany. And if you look at the numbers worldwide, it's even 4,250 terawatt hours of electricity generation. And this is around 15% of worldwide energy production. But here's the catch. The potential is almost exhausted. Further expansion is practically impossible. Most suitable rivers are already being used and new construction projects are hardly possible for environmental reasons. In general, many players largely agree the era of new large-scale hydropower plants in many countries is coming to an end. Does this mean that hydropower is a thing of the past? Not necessarily. Because while we have largely focused on rivers and lakes for hydropower, so far we have almost overlooked one resource, rain. Again, an example from my country, Germany had 902 millimeters of annual rain in 2024, making it an extremely rainy country, at least in Europe, with lots of rooftops that collect hundreds of liters of water every year. So what if we used all these perfect, already sealed roof surfaces, not only for solar cells, but also to generate electricity from the surplus rain? That's exactly what a research team from Singapore has achieved. They have developed a new technology that actually allows them to generate electricity from falling raindrops. In doing so, they have circumvented a physical problem that was previously considered unsolvable, the so-called Debye length. But that wasn't the only problem with previous approaches. Let's take a closer look at the basics. It has long been known that when water flows over a solid surface, electrical charges are separated. This occurs at the interface, so at the point of contact between the liquid, so the water, and a solid such as the inner wall of a tube. This is also known as the interface effect. The following happens during the interfacial effect. Water consists of H2O molecules. On a small scale, these molecules break down through self-ionization into positively charged hydrogen ions, so H+, and negatively charged hydroxide ions, OH-. The interaction at the interface, so the contact between the water and the tubes, separates these ions from each other. The H plus ions move downwards with the flow, while the OH minus ions migrate upwards along the pipe wall. In theory, this results in a clear spatial separation of charges. Different electrical charges are created at the upper and the lower end of the tube, and when these ends are connected by an electrode, electricity actually flows. Also, it is very little, of course. Researchers, therefore, came up with the idea that if we could make maximum use of this interface, we might be able to generate more electricity. In earlier approaches, tiny channels known as nanotubes or microtubes were used. The idea is pretty simple. More surface area per volume sounds like more charge separation and therefore more electricity. At first, this sounded logical, but this is precisely where two major physical problems arise. Firstly, capillary forces. Capillary forces are forces that act between water and a narrow tube wall. They arise because water molecules want to bond with each other as well as with the surface. In very thin tubes, the water is almost held back. It hardly flows through naturally, sometimes even flowing upwards, and pumps are needed to force it through. Unfortunately, these pumps ultimately consume more energy than is gained from the electricity produced by charge separation, so in practice, it doesn't pay off. Another obstacle that is almost more relevant is the so-called Debye length. So you can imagine it like this. An electric double layer forms at the interface due to charge separation. The OH- ions attach themselves to the wall and the H-plus ions are drawn into the water. 
However, the double layer of positively and negatively charged ions is only a few nanometers thick. In pure water, the Debye length is around 220 nanometers, that's a friction of a hair's diameter. Only within this tiny layer can the ions truly separate. Further away, so in the rest of the water, the charges neutralize each other again very quickly, especially when the water flows continuously. This slows down the current that can be generated extremely. The Debye length is therefore a natural limit at which all previous approaches with tiny channels have failed. Simply not enough usable electricity is produced. It is precisely these problems that meant that these early approaches were simply not profitable enough in practice. Until now at least, because researchers in Singapore have now succeeded in overcoming these physical limitations and achieving a real breakthrough. They have developed a new principle known as a plug flow principle. The setup is relatively simple and as you may know, for example from other videos from my channel about technologies, simple is usually very very, very good. By the way, thank you to everyone who has already subscribed and to everyone who has left such lovely comments under my last videos. This really motivates me to keep recording these videos. Even though I know my English is not perfect, I will try to take on board all these tips and corrections you give me and try to improve. So thank you for that. And if you haven't subscribed yet, maybe you would like to do so now to get more videos about technologies for a better future. And of course, all of my videos are well researched by humans, not by AI, and we have transparent sources too, you can always check down in the corner, there's where you see this number and it leads to the source. But back to the topic. So what is the setup like? You have a water tower, so an elevated container such as a vertical pipe filled with water, ideally rainwater. This water tower serves as a reservoir and ensures that the water can flow out by gravity. In real life, this could also be a rain gutter or something similar. At the bottom of the water tower is a thin metal needle attached horizontally. The water drips out of the container through this needle and then hits the upper inner wall of a vertically mounted plastic tube directly. The tube can be made of a simple polymer such as FEP, something that is widely available anyway. This tube has an inner diameter of about 2 mm and a length of about 30 cm. The water then drips into this tube, but not as continuous stream, but in the form of individual drops. And that's exactly the trick. This way, the water does not form a uniform, uninterrupted column of water, but breaks up into many small plugs of water separated by air bubbles. You can actually imagine it like a string of pearls. Water, air, water, air, alternating continuously. This flow pattern is called plug flow. At the bottom of the tube, the water is then collected in a metal cup. And now comes a crucial point from a scientific point of view. Both the metal needle at the top and the collection cup at the bottom are electrically connected. Both are connected to sensitive measuring instruments. This allows us to measure exactly how much electrical voltage and how much current is actually generated by the flow of water. So we can see how much power we can generate. The current is generated solely because of the special flow pattern. This ensures that a very effective charge separation takes place at every boundary between water and air, which is constantly being reformed as the water flows down. At each water edge, so where the water recedes and the wall dries, negative hydroxide ions are absorbed on the inner wall, while the mobile positively charged protons, so the H plus ions, are transported further along with the water. This is a significant improvement over previous methods, as charge separation takes place repeatedly and over long distances and not just in a thin layer directly on the wall. This makes it possible to overcome the classical Debye length limit. Thanks to the many sequences of water and air, the separated charges can now be separated by many centimeters. And the results are truly impressive. In the researchers' experiments, this method achieved an energy conversion efficiency of over 10%. This means that more than 1 in 10 joules of the water's potential energy is converted directly into electrical energy. And at a flow rate of 80 milliliters per minute through a 32 centimeter long FEP tube with an inner diameter of only 2 millimeters, they achieved an average electrical output of 440 microwatts. And that's with just one single tube. The power density of this approach can be up to 100 watts 
per square meter. According to the researchers, the system works reliably, is resistant to water contaminants such as salt or temperature fluctuations in the water and requires only gravity, no pump or complicated technology. But we have to come back to this in the big hurdle of this video. Overall, the plug flow principle naturally opens up completely new possibilities for decentralized and environmentally friendly power generation anywhere where water flows from top to bottom. So this sounds very groundbreaking and I want to be honest, I'm really excited about this technology also because it is an approach that hasn't been big in the discussion about energy production lately. Nevertheless, there are also some hurdles and challenges with this new technology that we need to take a closer look at. Some of you know that from my videos, this is a big hurdle or the big butt of the video where we take a look at the problems and limitations of a technology. Before we get to that, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and activate the bell so you don't miss any more videos and support my channel. So what are the hurdles? Even if the paper describes a really cool new approach, the researchers are also aware of its limitations. One significant limitation arises directly from the physical mechanism. Charging and effective charge separation only occurs at the recessive edge of each water plug, so always where a water-air transition takes place. This means that the system is heavily dependent on the discontinuity of the flow, which is precisely the trick, but it also means that with a continuous water jet, the effectiveness would immediately decrease dramatically. The plug flow must therefore be maintained in a controlled manner. Longer continuous water columns or blurring of the air bubbles in the stream drastically reduce the power. Another limitation is the size of the system. According to the experiments, tubes longer than 32 cm do not provide any additional performance gain. For more output, more modules are needed which requires space, material and installation effort. And if you think further ahead, further challenges are foreseeable, especially for real outdoor applications. At the top of the list is maintenance. The narrow tubes could become clogged with dirt, algae or other small particles over time, especially with rainwater. Which was interesting for me because in the paper the researchers stated that the system is very robust. But I think in a real world scenario this might be not so true because just imagine dirt in rainwater. Also the stability in frost, hail or storms could become a problem. Added to this is a long-term resistance of the tubes to UV radiation and extreme temperature conditions. So far the whole thing has only been tested in the laboratory and never under real conditions so that remains to be seen. And there's another point. In order to assess how useful the plug flow system really is, it is important to compare it with other systems on the roof, for example with a classic solar system. According to the researchers from Singapore, an optimally constructed plug flow generator could achieve a power density of around 100 watts per square meter. Under ideal conditions, so in direct sunlight, a modern photovoltaic system can achieve significantly more than 200 watts per square meter, which is about twice as much. But what I found exciting was that even when it rains, the solar system still produces electricity. We sometimes forget this. Admittedly, significantly less, only 10 to 15% of the energy yield, but depending on the intensity of the rain, that could still be up to 50 watts per square meter, which is still good. But here, the rainwater solution would be a perfect addition to produce electricity around the clock and in all weather conditions. But there's of course one more problem that often comes up with new innovations. So we have to talk about the price. To be clear, I can only estimate this because this is still in research but the cost could become a problem. The tubes for generating electricity are made of FEP. And although this is considered a cheap and widely used polymer, the market price for an FEP hose with an appropriate diameter in the research paper is currently around 5 euros per meter. The price is definitely lower in big industrial scale, but still. If you go through the numbers, you would need around 5000 meters of FEP tubing for a plug flow system covering an area of 10 square meters, assuming dense packaging. That would cost around 25,000 euros for the material alone. On top of that, you would need the needles, brackets and all the electrical wiring and probably the most expensive part, the construction. For a solar system, that would be more around like 2,500 to 3,000 euros. But as I said, these are all rough estimates and we have seen how much cost can reduce in solar energy, where in around 10 years, the price has fallen over 90%. 
But of course, the cost will make it hard for the innovation to succeed. But I still think it's an exciting addition to photovoltaics, especially when it rains and we should put more research in it. But there's one last point. There's competition to it. With tanks, triboelectrical nanogenerators, solar modules can now also generate electricity from individual raindrops. The friction between the drops and a special transparent layer in the solar module generates electrical energy. In the laboratory, this generates up to a third of a normal solar output. That is 50 to 100 watts per square meter. The technology is not yet on the market, but it is, of course, a direct competitor. If you are interested in learning more about this technology, please write that in the comments and then I will also make a video about it. But to come to a conclusion, I still think this is a really exciting development, but more as a supplement to traditional energy sources than as a real replacement. The big advantage is clearly the ease of retrofitting. Anyone who already has solar power or just wants to experiment should definitely keep an eye on this topic. Now, here you find another video about a German startup that built special drones and became in only a few years the most expensive startup of Germany and also one of the most successful startups in whole of Europe. And with that, macht's gut, which means take care in Germany. See you next time, your Jaco.